Being the king of anything can be a difficult task. Just ask Conan the Barbarian, who would wear a crown that sat heavy upon his head once he became the ruler of his land. For our purposes, that land is the fantasy genre, and no one can really argue that Conan the Barbarian ruled and still continues to do so. The 1982 feature, which we covered previously on another episode, brought to life Robert E. Howard's sword-swinging hero in a way that's never truly been equaled. Sorry, Momo, you, s you still rock. But how do you follow up a film like that, which was such a massive hit? In the case of Conan, you make a shorter epic with a larger ensemble cast that includes an NBA star, a singing star, and a wrestling star under a lot of special effects makeup. So come with us now, back to the times of high adventure, as we travel with a barbarian and his motley crew with Conan the Destroyer. Conan the Barbarian was one of the biggest hits of 1982 and would set the stage for many of the fantasy films that would come after it. In fact, it would create its own subgenre within the fantasy film world with the barbarian films like Deathstalker, Ador, and A Return of Hercules, just to name a few. With star Arnold Schwarzenegger's film career about to take off massively, producers didn't want to wait on making a follow-up. Timing-wise, things didn't work out to get the original director John Milius back to helm the sequel. Milius' next film would be the legendary Red Dawn that would come out the same year as Destroyer. Wolverine! So instead, the De Laurentiis team would bring in Richard Fleischer, a director with a wide and varied history of films beneath his belt. Fleischer's history ran from movies like The Vikings, Dr. Doolittle with Rex Harrison, The Boston Strangler with Tony Curtis, and just prior to Destroyer, Amityville 3D. That's right, kids. The guy who made Amityville 3D brought you the happy-go-lucky song and dance filled Dr. Doolittle and would make a movie where a horny, hey, it's got a horn, statue is wanting a virgin sacrifice. A jeweled horn. Only she can procure it. Another reason Dino De Laurentiis was keen on Fleischer was the fact that he could deliver more family-friendly action. I'm sorry about what happened the last time. <laughs> With the R rating that was given to Conan the Barbarian, it was felt that some box office was missing due to the limitations of the rating. While it would seem a no-brainer that a movie based on the bloody and violent stories of a barbarian warrior would need an R rating, Conan the Destroyer was not going to follow that way of thinking. We shall see. But more on that in a moment. The story for the film would come from two men very familiar with not only Conan, but the comic and fantasy genres, Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway. Only a year prior, they would pin the Frank Frazetta and Ralph Bakshi animated sword and sorcery epic Fire and Ice. I swear, we will get to that one. The screenplay would be written by Stanley Mann, who that same year would see his screenplay for Stephen King's Firestarter hit screens. Charlie? 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 Sorry, Daddy. Mann had previously written a number of films, but notably the David Carradine starring Circle of Iron, which would make a good double feature with Conan the Destroyer. Not gonna lie. You're a barbarian. You live free in the world. You owe allegiance to no one. Is that not so? It is, and it always will be. Filming began in Mexico City in November of 83 and would stretch into February of 84 before getting its summer release in June. This would be after Mann would retool the film's story into his version of the script. Remember when I said we'd get to the whole family-friendly barbarian theme? Let's talk about that now. The story that Conway and Thomas made fell within that old-school Conan way of thinking. When the idea of making this film a PG level story, Stanley Mann retooled it based on what the production company had in mind to get more butts in seats, as it were. Conway and Thomas were given the story credit for the film, even though it had been so heavily changed from what they had in mind. And a promise to you? A lie. But the story they created would actually live on in a comic tale of Conan they'd released called Conan the Barbarian, The Horn of Azoth. The character names were changed for the comic, but the original story was intact. The film sort of just starts with Conan having gained a new friend and fellow thief in Malik. This was before Tracy Walter would become the greatest sidekick of all time as Bob the Goon in Batman, opposite his boss, Jack Nicholson. Bob? Done. While Conan is meditating and praying, a group of warriors randomly attack him and Malik. Malik isn't a pushover and takes a couple of them out on his own, but the battle is fairly bloodless. 
one of the first signs this is a different type of Conan film. It turns out these are the soldiers of Queen Taramis, who want Conan to take her niece Jenna, who is the only one that can retrieve the gem known as the Heart of Araman that will allow them to get to the Horn of Dagoth, a very Lovecraft-sounding god. It is here that you realize Conan is living within an RPG. What do you want? I need your help. No. Conan, as you would guess, tells Taramis no, but she offers him his heart's desire, which is Valeria, returned to his side from the land of the dead. You can bring back the dead? Do as I ask of you, and I will. Conan, upon realizing this, agrees. Not knowing a queen with the name Taramis is always going to be evil. The queen ensures that Bombata, her niece's bodyguard, will kill Conan once the jewel is secured. So when the key is in my niece's hand, I want your sword in Conan's heart. As well as reminding him that Jenna needs to remain a virgin. It is here you can insert any joke you like about Wilt Chamberlain and his 20,000 strong track record with the ladies. How many times have I seen a man? A real man? All I've seen is you. The barbarian is sent off with the princess and her protector on the quest. Along the way, again, he's living in an RPG, Conan acquires more traveling companions. He rescues the wizard Akiro from cannibals to use his magic and fierce warrior Zula from angry villagers. I need you. I'm yours. They arrive near the castle of Toth Amun, who kidnaps the sleeping Jenna under the guise of a smoke-like dragon. The group journey into the castle and defeat the wizard and are nearly killed by the evil queen's soldiers. Jenna makes a move on Conan, who, like the gentleman he is, family friendly here peeps, tells her no. Could there ever be anyone else but her? Another queen? Lad on your knife. Not on your life. He's a one Valkyrie man. Conan and company, which sounds like an amazing kids show, eventually find the horn and after more treachery from Bombada and the queen, have to fight a resurrected Dagoth and save Jenna from being sacrificed. <laughs> With Jenna now queen, Conan leaves alone after once again turning down an offer to marry the young queen and his companions staying behind in various roles in the queen's court. Conan sets off to become a king on his own, but that's another story. What will you do? Uh, find my kingdom and the queen to sit beside me. Conan the Destroyer is an interesting film for a number of reasons and stands out when it comes to the world of 80s fantasy films. Arnold was asked by Fleischer to actually get bigger for the movie, if you can believe it, gaining an extra 10 pounds of muscle. And he also made a point of keeping him fairly unclothed during the film. If you compare Destroyer to Barbarian, Conan doesn't wear much at all. That's because the director wanted to show off the actor's muscles and physique. Arnold wore less than anyone, even the women, which was typically the opposite when most people think of sword and sorcery films. This was the first major film for actress Olivia Diabo. Diabo was only 14 at the time the film was shot. Chamberlain and Schwarzenegger both took on the roles of protector of the young actress on set. Speaking of Chamberlain, this was his one and only film role. The basketball star was over seven feet tall and it took some work finally finding a horse that he could ride where his feet didn't touch the ground. <laughs> Chamberlain's casting was part of what made Destroyer stand out when it came to its diverse cast. Besides Chamberlain, Grace Jones would join the film as Zula. Her character was even more of an interesting change as Zula, in the comics and stories, was actually a black male warrior. What do you want? To come with you. By the time the filmmakers realized this, they had already cast the singer who was actually one of my favorite parts of the film. This was also Grace Jones' first major film role, and she took it seriously, training for 18 months, learning how to wield the long pole she used for fighting. Even with this, Jones sent two stuntmen to the hospital and wound up hitting Chamberlain in the head while also really biting him during their fight scene. That's apparently his own blood and actual pain we're seeing on screen. I still find it funny that, even with a PG rating, 
Grace Jones has literally only a tail covering her backside for the entire film, but she's still got more covering her than Arnold. Mako, besides Arnold, was the only returning actor from the original film coming back as the wizard Akuro. Where Subutai the Archer was more serious, Malik, played by Tracy Walter, is certainly considered the comedy relief. I know when to steal and when not to. <laughs> to the point the character becomes the new queen's court jester. Do I qualify? But every movie needs a great villain, and Conan the Destroyer found it in Sarah Douglas as Queen Taramis. Just prior in 1980, Douglas played the evil Ursa, the right hand of General Zod in Superman 2. Superman! <laughs> and would continue playing a number of juicy baddie roles throughout her ongoing career, including a number of genre films like The Return of Swamp Thing, Beastmaster 2, and Return of the Living Dead 3. As we've established, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a big guy, so the only way to make a bigger monster is find the biggest guy around, and that was who was under the Dagoth costume. Andre the Giant was uncredited in this role, but that's who was battling out with Conan in the final fight of the film, so yes, he was the Brute Squad that was needed to take on Conan the Destroyer. Beat it or I'll call the Brute Squad. I'm on the Brute Squad. You are the Brute Squad. Speaking of big guys, Pat Roach played Toth Almond in his human form and as the monstrous version of the character that fights Conan. Roach is familiar to many of you fantasizing about fantasy film regulars thanks to his turns in Willow, Clash of the Titans, and the Indiana Jones films. Come on, get on, get on. Even with the PG rating, there are still a number of things that make Conan the Destroyer surprisingly able to still garner that rating. PG-13 wouldn't be around till a couple of months after the film's release. There's still some blood here, and Dagoth is pretty disturbing. Olivia Diabo was actually terrified of the monster on set. There's also the fact that Diabo was in fact 14 years old in this, and the subject of her virginity is a major plot point. What I do need you for to see that this dear child is returned safely to the palace, both the treasure and her virginity intact. As is her being in love with Conan. Arnold was 37 during this movie. Apparently, there were a number of scenes that had to be cut in order to still get the rating. There's a scene where Conan is seduced by the queen in order to get him to take on his quest. There's also a scene where Queen Taramis gets frisky with the Dagoth statue too that was left out on the floor. Destroyer also had a lot of instances where animals weren't treated great, and in some territories, these scenes were cut. Conan the Destroyer wasn't a major hit when it was released, and that would appear due to the fact that the movie changed the tone rather dramatically from the original. Conan wasn't the quiet and brooding force of nature he was in the first film. He told jokes and punched camels while traveling with a funny thief. But mixed in with this was a lot of rather adult content, which meant it didn't hit home for either kids or adults, really. As such, where Conan the Barbarian made four times its budget back, Destroyer's $18 million budget didn't even double its investment, making just over $30 million. While Schwarzenegger enjoyed his time on the film, he wasn't happy with the changes to Conan's character and story. He tried to convince the producers to keep the original seriousness, but to no avail. As such, Destroyer would be the last time he'd play the character, but it wouldn't be the last time he'd work with Fleischer. They'd team up the following year for Red Sonja, where Arnold would be playing a character very similar to the Conan and Destroyer, but not actually named Conan. We'll get to that one eventually too, I promise. Conan the Destroyer is one of those divisive movies when it comes to the fans. Many either love it or hate it. I actually enjoy it for what it is, which is more of a fun-loving film that manages to have a darkness to it when it comes to the plot that's just this side of sleazy. In trying to make it a family-friendly film, I think they managed to make Destroyer have a dirty secret. The type of formula shown in Conan the Destroyer, where the fighter hero becomes more cocky and funny and less brooding, would actually become part of the Conan clones that would be released throughout the 80s, most notably in the Deathstalker franchise, which there are so many. One, two, three, I think you're right. Even with the change, Destroyer actually continues what I loved about the original as well. These movies, 
even if they are about barbarians, manage to be more evolved than others when it comes to their story and cast. Here we've got a film where half the lead characters are different ethnicities, including a black woman playing a role that was supposed to be a guy and kicking butt in it. I think we made a friend. She's the equal to every male warrior in the film, if not better than. The rumors are still going that possibly we will see Arnold return as King Conan. He keeps waving that sword around in his social media posts, just taunting us all. And I'd love to see it happen. But even if it doesn't, I still love the two we got of Arnold being one of the greatest to ever solve the riddle of steel in a time of high adventure. Rule shudders all with me. I will have my own kingdom. My own queen.